I'm Al McFarland, and this is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Corey Day. He's the principal at a new consulting firm. It's called Blue Ox Strategies. He's the former uh, executive director of the Minnesota DSL Party. We're continuing our conversation about uh, the future, the history of uh, politics in our community. One of the things that we're writing about you uh, in Insight News, Corey, is your um, statement that you want to broaden the pipeline. Mm -hmm. You want to open up a strategy that brings uh, a number of uh, dynamic, young, uh, mm -hmm. sort of assertive, aggressive people to the party and to the political uh, arena. Uh, what's the vision? What do you intend to do uh, as a leader and with the organization Blue Ox Strategies? Well, it kind of brings me back. I remember in 2010, um, we had a, a, a PAC called Impact Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I think about you know, what we did, we're educating voters, doing a lot of field work, um, a lot of advertising, just really trying to promote folks to get out and vote. Um, and I just think about the f people who came through that organization and what they're doing now. It's just there's some amazing folks who, that was their first engagement to uh, the, the political arena. I just want to figure out ways with Blue Ox to create those kind of opportunities again where you have an actual, you know, A, you bring it to the communities, uh, B, you, you open it up and you give people a real chance to come and participate and be involved. And I think right now is that when, you know, there are no open doors, right? And so my hope is that we create uh, an environment where the doors are open, where we get young, bright folks to work on these different issues, different, different uh, things that we're going to be working on. Uh, you know, different initiatives. Um, so the hope is just really to create the opportunity for them to have an open door and know that Blue Ox Strategy is gonna be a place where their talent is welcomed. I think you've got some real challenges ahead though, mm -hmm. uh, Corey Day, among mm -hmm. them. Uh, there is the sentiment, you've heard this in the community where people, black people will say, we've been loyal to a fault mm -hmm. to the Democratic Party, not only in Minnesota, but nationally. Yeah. And the criticism that goes with that statement, that declaration, is that uh, there's a feeling the party has not reciprocated. The party has maintained yeah. a sort of cultural uh, paternalism. Mm. Uh, the idea that uh, even in the progressive arena, yeah. white is right and black steps back. Hmm. How do you combat that? Do you hear that? Or am yeah, I no, no, it? no, that is. And, and if you hear that, yeah. how, do you, how do you address that so that people know that, uh, that even though there are uh, kind of cultural barriers or barriers of understanding, or barriers of privilege, hmm, right. uh, that there still is room for and really a mandate for change and inclusion. How do you address that? Yeah, no, that's, I, I wish I had just uh, an answer to, to, I don't have the total answer for that, but I do know the things, the things that I was seeing uh, before I left the party was these great groups were springing up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the one thing that I've been very impressed and proud of is that these different organizations, these different groups are are coming up outside of the party and they're breaking the wall down. They're not waiting for someone to invite them in anymore. They're just kicking the wall down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of attitude you gotta have. You can't wait for it, you just gotta just take it. And that's one of the things you, you see with uh, the way Congress changed with all these wonderful women who got elected. They didn't wait around. Mm -hmm. they, they kicked the door in and they're not taking any BS. I mean, there's things that we care about, there's issues, there's uh, priorities that we have. And what I, I think you're seeing more than ever, with especially some of these young folks who are getting elected, they're not, they're not gonna take a back seat anymore. It's time for us to make change. And I think the one thing that I'm, that I'm like, it emboldens me is watching these millennials and these young folks who are not waiting around anymore. They are taking the bull. They are starting their own organizations. They are running for different uh, seats within the party now. Um, that is, that's, the, that's how you make change. You don't wait for it and hope that someone's gonna hand it to you. You gotta go take it. You don't ask for permission. No, 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 and, I, and they are not asking for permission anymore, I tell you. I mean, it's uh, just wonderful when you see some of these folks who are getting elected and the, the young campaign teams around them who are helping lift them up. I can recall, um, you know, in the movement of Minnesota DSL, I remember mm -hmm. when uh, I think it was, um, before Representative Jefferson was elected, uh, there was a transition. Mm -hmm. Jefferson was 56, or in my neighborhood in North Minneapolis, the district numbers have changed. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, after him, uh, there was a question of who would succeed him. 
and there was a, a genuine discussion about whose right uh, it was to be there because yeah. of time in, in the party or time in the community. That conversation is changing a little bit now. Uh, are people saying just because you've been around 20 years doesn't mean you're guaranteed a seat? Oh, yeah. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that you're, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I, I imagine what you're going to see um, a lot of our long standing um, incumbents get challenged. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it goes back to the sense of saying, hey, since, because you've been here for 10 years doesn't mean this is your permanent seat. Mm -hmm. If I have better ideas, if I think that I have better policies, I'm going to go after it. And I think you're, you're going to see that a lot more um, in the future, not just here in Minnesota, you're going to see that all over the country where uh, incumbents aren't going to feel as safe um, in their seats because from the right or the left, you're going to see folks who feel like they have, you know, it's not some kind of God right to hold on to that seat. But if I feel like I have better ideas and I can run a better organization, I'm going to go after it. Is there a downside to that? Do you end up creating more um, fracturedness uh, yeah. and therefore make yourself or your party uh, less effective, less able to marshal mm -hmm. the numbers you need to guarantee a win? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's always an up and downside to it. I mean. You know, I'm not a believer per se. Just because you've been there a long means you're a bad legislator or you're not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I also believe that you know some of these folks have sat in the back of the bus for too long, and you know if they want to take their shot at it, if they want to go after it, if they want to take it, then go take it. No one's, it's not a it's not a birthright to any of these legislative seats or seats around any of these. None of these are birthrights. So yeah, as a, a person who works for the party, um, were you know inner party fights where primary is tough at times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but one thing that we never did, not once did someone come in my office and say, "Hey, Corey, I want to run for this seat," and I said to them, "You shouldn't do it." Or no, mm -hmm. I mean my job was to say, "Okay, well this is what you would need to do, and this is what it would take." I mean I've had folks walk into the the office and say, I want to run for president. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, okay, well, this is, <laughs> this, is how, this is what it takes to become the president of the United States. So it, it's one of those deals that it, it cuts both ways. Um, but it's one of those also, it's none of our rights to tell someone not to do it. So let's do politics 101. Let's talk to mm -hmm. the millennials and young people that mm -hmm. uh, are thinking about it. Let's talk to those who uh, feel like uh, really there's uh, no reason uh, to be involved because the cards, the decks are stacked yeah. against us already. Let's talk to those who are older, who feel like they've been either marginalized or disenfranchised mm -hmm. in the past, and because of that negative experience, right. they've become cynical. How do you uh, engage them? What is Politics 101 going to tell them to reignite the passion mm -hmm. or to support the passion that they're bringing, the curiosity they have about how to uh, become uh, able to change uh, the community, to change the world, and ultimately to change uh, the self, the person himself or herself? I mean, it's very basic on this front, and you know, I think it can go both ways and people believe in this or not, but those who show up. And the, one of the things that you know, I've always thought was amazing about our process here in Minnesota is that those who show up, try to run for, run for a party office or come to meetings and, and you know participate mm -hmm. that's the first step I mean you have to you have to want to be there you have to I mean you it, it's easy to be outside of the house throwing rocks right mm -hmm. you have to actually go inside and say how am I going to change it from within and I admit there's challenges to that it's not always easy I know that it, there's a lot of entrenched powers involved in that but the best way to change it is just to get involved and then make your, your lane through that that avenue um, and it's not just with the party. I mean, there's so many different resistance groups and other progressive groups that you can get involved with. But just sitting at home and, and complaining about it or, you know, screaming from the mountaintops, that's not going to change anything. Just getting, I mean, I, I always like to use, uh, looking at Representative Omar. Her organization, they didn't, they didn't sit around and wait. They ran for local offices. They ran, became chairs of the, of the local units. I mean, they are intertwined into the DFL now. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when that, their, the first strategy for a lot of folks was just to sit here and say, you guys, all, you guys are all awful and you, you don't really care about these progressive values. But then at a certain point, I think folks were like, well, 
I, I only can scream so loud. Mm -hmm. I, I need to just get involved in changing myself. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I would say, politics 101, mm -hmm. you, gotta, you, you gotta show up <coughs> to make any changes. So get involved, go to your local community meeting, go to your local DFL meeting, go to your local, you know, uh, whatever organization, whatever resistance group it could be that's a meeting in, in your district or in your community. Those who show up are th those who change things. So I would say to anyone at, from old to young, and, I've, and it, it's amazing to me because I've just seen so, I mean, so many people that would just blow your mind that were just, you know, a few years ago, just coming into the door. Um, and all of a sudden, I remember uh, Mayor Fryer. I remember I met Mayor Fryer when he first came to Minnesota. Um, and, you know, he was an attorney. He wasn't involved in politics. He was, I mean, he was just a, a guy who moved to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the one who, thing he... Who knew? Who knew? The one thing he was very clear about, and I mean, he, he talked to us about was, you know, I, I want to be involved. I think I can make a... Ch I, you know, I love this community. I, I love this state. I really want to get engaged in this. Next thing you know, the guy's mayor. I mean, these things are, are extremely feasible. I look at uh, Mayor Carter's the same way. He's always been civically engaged. But I remember when we first worked together, uh, I think it was uh, 2003 or four. Um, he was just getting out of college and just, and his question was, what do I have to do to, to make a change? How can I help my community? And same way, Melvin just, he started showing up. He started going to those meetings, getting to know his community, getting to know his local activists. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things that, I know it sounds very simplistic, but really it's those who change the world are those who show up. The pushback on that, uh, Corey Day, is that uh, I've heard in an experience where we go to the meeting mm -hmm. and the sense you get is that uh, the deck is stacked, mm. that it's the meeting before the meeting <laughs> and yeah. the meeting after the meeting yeah. uh, where the deals get cut and that uh, black person walks into meeting A and all of a sudden people are literally or figuratively whistling Dixie, yeah. uh, everybody's happy, good old days, and then nothing gets done in the course of the business or the order of the day, and leaving you to leave at adjournment uh, and to have the sense that the business is going to happen. Starts when you leave. Now yeah. that you're leaving. That's cynical. Mm. Uh, well, but how do, but no, your, your point is show up and stay there, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's true. I'm not, I, I, you know, I would be a liar if I said that you know, I haven't heard that, that story throughout the entire state. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are different, you know, units that, and the different, you know, party units that are better than others and are more inclusive than others. Mm -hmm. But I think just all in all, as a whole, um, you know, people are so resistant to different and new. Mm -hmm. And I, every organization I've been involved in is no, is no different. The DFL is no different. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses and say I haven't heard that, that story before because it's true. I, I, sometimes it is not the most welcoming environment. It, they make, you know, it, it should not create obstacles for people to be engaged and involved. And realistically, it does sometimes. And we've got to get better at that. And one of the ways we get better, as I said, is you show up and you, you become that leader who makes it welcoming for new people to walk into those doors. But I, I'm not going to sit. I'm not going to sit here and, and blow smoke. I admit there are definitely some challenges that uh, that <coughs> I experienced over my years there, and I still experience to this day. Corey, what's your personal history again? You, so, you know, where are you from? Yeah. So no, who's I, your mom? Who's your yeah. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago. Um, my mother was a nurse. Uh, my father worked at a hotel for 25 years. Um, very blue collar folks who good Democrats. Um, so yeah, I grew up in that kind of environment. My mom's from Tennessee, my dad's from Mississippi. So imagine the kind of values that they put forth on me, hard work, you know, um, you know, those who succeed are those who actually get out there and, and bust their butt to try to get things done. Sisters and brothers? Yeah, I got, I got two brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a youngest of four. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my brother, oh gosh, my brother's a uh, just retired, 30-year Marine, um, and a Trump voter. So, oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah, he tries to explain to me why Trump's uh, better on military and all these other issues. And you know, it's it's hard to see one of my own blood do that, but uh, you know. <laughs> that's the way it works. Yeah, that's I thought, that's. I thought that, it closed that way. That, that's, How about that, that, yeah. members of your family? Uh, yeah, they're all you know they're all good. They're all Democrats. Uh, um, you know, they're all you know, like they watch MSNBC all day and. and Want to talk about it all night these days, you know? <laughs> I I think my dad's obsessed with uh, Donald Trump. He just, you know, he can't stop watching, you know, the clown car, mm -hmm. uh, night in and night out. Um, so yeah, so I grew up with, uh, you know, grew up in the, the suburbs of uh, Chicago. Then, uh, like I said, I went to school at Illinois State and uh, 
played, uh, played ball there for my years there. And then after I graduated, um, I like to say I just went on the road show. And, and this is for folks who want to get involved, like, who want to like, how do you, like, how does this, you get into this field? I literally, I went where the work was. So, you know, if it was in San Francisco, there was a campaign, I packed my bag and went to San Francisco, if it was New Jersey or Florida. Uh, heck, in 2008, I was in Alaska, so for, uh, for Barack Obama. So I, I think the best way is just, especially when you're young, um, is just to, to go where the work is, um, shut up, work hard. You know, it, it's those, I will tell you right now, um, those who work hard, that gets you further <laughs> than you'll ever imagine. Um, I know that when I've hired people or I've done work on campaigns, it's that hard, the hard working guy you see that you know is going to succeed in this, who's going to be make it to that next level. We're out of time. Oh. Thank you. This is wonderful, man. <laughs> you know, I just, I, it's so easy to talk to you all, all the yeah. time. I, I appreciate you having me here, and I just, I, I love what you do for the community and um, the stories you tell and make sure that, you know, you hold everyone accountable. So we well, really appreciate your thank work. Thank you so much. These conversations are important, and we thank you for the work, the leadership, uh, the vision that you're sharing as well. Thank I'm you. Al McFarland, Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time.